Today, I want to talk about the process of seeking a response of faith from those with whom we share our good news. Yesterday's talk laid the groundwork for much of what we would like to say today. Now, today's presentation is divided into some subsections. So, subsection number one is believe that Jesus died on the cross. In recent years, I have become aware of a way of presenting the gospel invitation that kind of bothers me. I believe I have heard it from my earliest years, and I admit it really didn't bother me for a long time. Now it does. I have heard people say this, in order to be saved, you must believe that Jesus died on the cross. In the context of this discussion today, I mean that this is their summary of the requirement of faith. This is not just one item, okay? You say, how does a person get saved? They say, believe that Jesus died on the cross. Whenever I hear that nowadays, I get extremely uncomfortable. For one thing, is there anyone in a Christian church, unless it is a radically liberal church, who doesn't believe that Jesus died on the cross? For that matter, even some very liberal theologians would consider that a true statement, although they might balk at the doctrine of resurrection. You can see why I feel uncomfortable. Now, I know that the statement I'm evaluating leaves a lot of things unspoken that are implied, or at least usually implied, by the, by the speaker. Most of the time, people who say you are saved by believing that Jesus died on the cross mean by that that he died for our sins. In fact, that's often added. You must believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. But even with that addition, there is still unspoken material that the person usually has in mind. They usually mean to say, for example, that this belief in Christ's death is all that is necessary for salvation. The statement they make doesn't quite say that, but that's what they usually mean. Thus, they are normally proclaiming salvation by faith alone. Also unspoken, but usually implied, is the idea that Christ's work on the cross is sufficient to provide for our salvation. Thus, they mean to say that we are trusting in the sufficiency of his work of atonement. But the statement by itself doesn't communicate that. Let me be honest, I don't like this way of doing a gospel invitation. The very first disadvantage of this kind of invitation to faith is that it cannot be found in the Bible. Just think for a minute of John 3.16, John 5.24, 6.47, Acts 16.31, and so on. Not one of these verses invites us to get saved by believing that Jesus died on the cross. Why is it that we like to verbalize our message in ways the Bible does not do? <laughs> what is wrong with biblical language? Whatever happened to Bible language? And the associated question is this, what is wrong with our language? The simple fact of the matter is that the statement I am criticizing is technically incorrect. People are not saved by believing that Jesus died on the cross. They are saved by believing in Jesus for eternal life or eternal salvation. If we say it in the biblical way, we will be able to support our claim by direct biblical statements. But suppose a person I am witnessing to says, where does the Bible say that we are saved by believing that Jesus died on the cross? What am I going to do then? In that case, I would be compelled to take, a, take him to a number of scriptures and try to combine them to prove my point. But even then, I would not really have a statement of the Word of God that was exactly in line with the point I was making. I would like to see grace people abandon this form of invitation to faith. Let us always point men to Christ himself as the object of faith, rather than to some idea or concept that must be theologically clarified before it can really be understood. 
subsection two, which I call doing the two-step. <laughs> Here is another technique that bothers me. Many good grace people employ what I would call a two-step approach to faith. First, they invite people to believe the basic facts of the gospel. And then they ask them to appropriate the truth for themselves. In describing the second step, they often prefer the word trust to the word belief. I happen to think that people who take this approach to evangelism are at least sometimes running scared. They do not want to be accused of making faith mere intellectual assent. Thus, they try hard to make clear that just believing the facts doesn't save us. Appropriating those facts for ourselves, that is, trusting Christ for our own salvation, is the crucial issue, according to them. This approach to things opens the door for the famous illustrations about the chair or the elevator or something similar. Here is an elevator, they would say. Do you believe that it can carry you to the top story of this building? If the answer is yes, the next question is, what do you need to do to get to the top story of this building? The answer is supposed to be trust in the elevator by getting on. Now, in the distant past, I used such illustrations myself, and I confess this fact with embarrassment. <laughs> if I could wear a sackcloth and ashes this morning for doing so, I would. <laughs> Illustrations of the type I'm referring to do show considerable creativity, <laughs> but I am afraid the creativity here is badly misused. What is created is another idea that is absent from the Bible. Where in the New Testament do we find any such presentation as this? Sorry, friends, it just isn't there. And if you heard yesterday's talk, you will know one of the reasons that it is not there. You see, as we noted yesterday, the facts surrounding the gospel message, such as the death and resurrection of Christ, are important facts for what they tell us about the reasons for trusting Christ. But believing these facts doesn't save anybody. People are only saved when they believe that Jesus gives them eternal life the moment they believe in him for that. Let's return for a moment to that deserted island in the Pacific Ocean that I invented for yesterday's talk, and where apparently a lot of you were trapped. <laughs> My hypothetical unsaved man has just read the words of Jesus in John 6:47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. And I, I hasten to add here because somebody asked me this question. How does he know he's believing in Jesus? Because the verse doesn't say the name Jesus. That's why I said he got a scrap of paper that included John 6, 43 to 47, and he could read 43 that said Jesus said, and he read 47. So the name of Jesus is in this illustration, just to clarify that. So he reads the words of Jesus in John 6, 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. All this person needs to do is to believe that statement and eternal life is his. There is no two-step process at all. The issues involved in eternal salvation are significantly muddied by the two-step approach I am discussing. The two-step approach seems to imply that two acts of faith are essential to one's salvation. The first of these is belief in the facts. The second is an act of personal trust. So this approach ignores the instrumental value of the facts of the gospel in bringing men to faith in Christ. And it tends to elevate them to the level of a preliminary condition, which must be followed by a second step, namely trust. Please notice that the approaches I have objected to so far in this talk tend to blur the necessary focus on the person of Christ as the object of faith. In the case of belief that Jesus died on the cross, the focus is on an action he performed, admittedly an indispensable action. 
In the two-step scenario that we approach Christ first by believing certain facts about him, the simple truth is that Jesus can be directly believed for eternal salvation apart from any detailed knowledge of what he did to provide it. I'm not saying that happens often, but when it happens, it's real. In other words, the sufficiency of Christ is the true focus of the faith that brings salvation. Can I repeat that? That's a core statement. In other words, the sufficiency of Christ is the true focus of the faith that brings salvation. I am contending today that until we have that concept clearly in mind, we will be vulnerable to making appeals to faith that tend to cloud the issues rather than clarify them. If I didn't think there was a danger here, I wouldn't be talking to you this morning about it. If anybody in the world should be able to present a crystal clear gospel message and a clear appeal to faith, it ought to be grace people like ourselves. But in a lot of cases, we are not doing nearly as good a job as we should. That leads to the sixth and final subsection, inviting people to believe. So now let's talk about leading a person to faith in Christ. In my discussion to this point today, I have been largely clearing away brushwood. I've been trying to point out that there are some mistakes that are made in inviting people to believe. Now let's consider the issue from a positive standpoint. Let's suppose I am talking to Ralph. It just so happens that the man who introduced me is named Ralph, but uh, I'm not talking to him. He's a saved man. Even if he thinks I'm going to miss the rapture, he's still saved. <laughs> Let's suppose I've been talking to Ralph, an unsaved young man. I have given him the gospel about the death and resurrection of Christ. I have emphasized the point that the Lord Jesus, by his death on the cross, has completely satisfied God in regard to Ralph's sin. Christ has paid for all the sins Ralph would ever commit from the day of his birth to the day of his death. Thus, Jesus has purchased Ralph's way to heaven. When I'm talking to an individual, I always go through that. Okay? The one thing Ralph needs now is eternal life. People who don't have this go to hell, according to Revelation 20, verse 15. Without new birth, we are unable to enter the kingdom of God despite Jesus' death for our sins, John 3, 3. And the alternative to eternal life is to perish, John 3, 16. However, I tell Ralph, eternal life is available on one condition alone, and that condition is faith in Jesus. I now turn to verses like John 3, 16, 5, 24, 6, 47, and very especially John 6:35 to 40, one of my favorite passages for evangelistic purposes. I spend time on these verses, but I particularly want to focus the individual, if possible, on John 6:35 to 40. Let me now give my presentation to Ralph in the first person. I'm going to speak as follows to him. Ralph, notice how Jesus stresses the fact that believing in him has permanent results. In verse 35, he insists that the person who comes to him for the bread of life will never get hungry. For that bread again, and the person who believes in him will never be thirsty for the water of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. Let me put it this way to you, Ralph. If a person could lose the bread or water of life after coming to Jesus for it, he would be hungry or thirsty again, wouldn't he? But notice, Jesus says that can't happen. He says the same thing in a different way in verse 37. There he says that if a person comes to him, he will never throw him out. Look also at verses 38 to 39. Here Jesus says that he came down from heaven to do his Father's will. And his Father's will is that Jesus should lose none of those that the Father has given to him, and that he should raise them all up at the last day. And then I say to Ralph, and then notice how he repeats this idea in verse 40. 
Everyone who believes in him gets eternal life and will be raised up at the last day. Notice, Ralph, that it all depends on Jesus doing God's will, not on us doing God's will. If I believe in Jesus for eternal life, I get it, and he does the rest. He does God's will, so he will never throw me out. He will raise me up at the last day. I will never again hunger for the bread of life, and I will never thirst for the water of life. Do you think you understand this, Ralph? Hopefully Ralph says he does. If he says he doesn't, doesn't, I will ask him, well, what seems to puzzle you, Ralph? Now, my experience in working with unsaved people tells me that at this point in the presentation, I will often get a question like this. Oh, do you mean that if I believe in Jesus for eternal life that I can go out and do anything I want and still go to heaven? I want you to know I'm delighted when I get that question because it indicates to me that I have gotten it over, that this is a gift, and that it is not withdrawn from us even if we behave badly. My usual way of responding to that question is that being born again is like being born into a family. We are always members of that family, even if we are scoundrels. But if we have good parents, they're not going to let us run wild. They will discipline and correct us and do their best to get us on the right path. So if I have successfully answered Ralph's questions and he tells me he understands what I've been saying to him, I can get down to the bottom line. Here is one approach that I feel comfortable about. Okay, Ralph, you say it's all clear to you. And maybe as we talked, you not only understood Jesus' promise, but you also believed it. If you have believed, then you now have eternal life. Do you remember how we went over John 5, 24? Well, if you have heard Jesus' word and believed it, that verse says that you have eternal life, that you will never come into the judgment before God to decide your eternal destiny, that you've already passed from death to life. At this point, of course, I can ask him directly if he does believe. It depends on the situation whether I will ask that or not, or let him volunteer it. If he says yes, I can also ask, then do you know for sure that you have eternal life and will be with the Lord Jesus forever? If he also responds affirmatively to this and gives me no reason to doubt his veracity, I can and should regard him as saved. I now realize that no one is saved by praying a prayer. They are saved when they understand God's offer of eternal life through Jesus and believe it. That's when people are saved. And that's the only time when people are saved. All of the excess baggage that we bring into our encounter with unsaved sinners is just that, excess baggage. In this brief make-believe encounter with Ralph, I tried to give him something to believe about Jesus Christ. I wanted him to realize that you could believe Jesus' promises about eternal life, that when you did, you were saved forever. That's all I basically wanted. Everything I might have included in my presentation, and as I've suggested, I've, I would include a great deal. Everything I might have included in my presentation leading up to the issue of faith was designed to prepare the way for that faith. I work on the conviction that if a person understands God's provision for salvation through the cross of Christ, that it will be easier for him or her to believe in Jesus for eternal life. But the bottom line is this. I want people to know that the moment they believe in Christ for this free gift, they are saved and saved forever. Let me add one final word. I find this a most liberating approach to evangelism. I have done my part if I have presented the message clearly. But faith in the heart is the work of God's Spirit, not a function of my technique, and not a function of my evangelistic dynamism. The simple word of God responded to in simple faith. That's what leading people to Christ is all about.